Hey Jared, this is Brian Holder. How are you? I'm good. Sorry, I, I thought I sent the link to you. I'm sending it, emailing it right now to your email address. Uh, okay. Oh no, no worries. I'll uh, I'll go look in there and uh, click on it if you're ready. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm good to go. Okay. All right. Well, I'll uh, uh, end the phone call and then I'll uh, click on the Zoom link. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Okay. You're welcome. See you in a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye bye. Hey, can you hear me now? I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me okay? I can. You sound great. Perfect. Um, so basically what I'll do um, is I, for all these races I've been doing, I have like a kind of just like a, a little summary of questions. Sure. Not too, uh, complicated. And I'll do a video for that so it's like, you know, more digestible for viewers and it's not like 40 minutes. Right. Um, and I'll wind down the video um, with like a, you know, thank you for talking to me or whatever. Uh, and then I have some more questions um, after that that I'll make sure and report to just so I don't miss anything for that. Sure. And that'll be the uh, profile I'm doing of the, the race as a whole. Okay, so, great. Great. Um, so, yeah, just in a second here then, I will um, hit record. Okay. And I'll uh, start rolling. So just one second here. All right. And I'll, I'll uh, introduce you and everything. Sure. Um, and uh, it's specifically, because I wanted to make sure I had it right, it's the Liberty Caucus, right? That's correct. That's the uh, organization that nominated me. Perfect. All right, so I will go ahead here in three, two... Recording in progress. Hello, I'm Jared McNett, a political reporter for the Sioux City Journal and frequent guest on the On Iowa Politics podcast. I'm here today to chat with Brian Jack Holder, the Liberty Caucus challenger in Iowa's 4th Congressional District. He's running against Republican incumbent Representative Randy Feenstra and Democratic candidate Ryan Bell. Good afternoon, Brian. Good afternoon, Jared. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate in this. Absolutely. Um, so I think maybe the easiest way to start is to just get a little background about you for folks who might not know you. So how old are you? Um, what sort of work do you do? And where do you live? 
I uh, have lived my whole life in Pottawatomie County. Uh, I grew up in the Crescent area uh, and Council Bluffs, so I live sort of north of Council Bluffs. Uh, in terms of uh, my uh, education, I graduated from St. Albert High School in Council Bluffs, uh, Iowa Western Community College, went there on a basketball scholarship but couldn't play, so I walked on the baseball team. Uh, got my Associate of Arts degree there in 93. Attended Bellevue University in Bellevue, Nebraska from 93 to 95, earned my BS in psychology with a minor in speech communications, and then uh, completed my education at Creighton University School of Law in 1998. And for my employment, I've worked for a couple of corporations over the last uh, 15 years, but I uh, am a citizen journalist, photographer, videographer, uh, filmmaker. So I film uh, over 100 events here in the local community. And I put most of this content on my Facebook and YouTube channel so that people can enjoy uh, the basketball, football games, uh, the school concerts. But I also film town halls and community meetings to uh, sort of do like you guys do, except uh, instead of printing a paper, I'm doing it with my video camera. Yeah, and um, you, you used a phrase that some folks might not be familiar with. So, so to you, what does it kind of mean to be a, a citizen journalist? Well, it just means that uh, I'm not working for a uh, recognized, organized news uh, corporation uh, to produce content. I'm an entrepreneur, a free marketeer, so I go out there and pay my ticket to get in these games and then film the event and uh, do my best job. I film the game with uh, two cameras, one on the scoreboard and one on the contest. So people watch my games. It's a professional broadcast that uh, I do for free. So I've got some local sponsors that help defray the costs of my productions. But uh, just citizen journalists also go to town halls and uh, record those events for the community so that the voters can be totally informed and engaged on election day and they know the candidates and the issues and uh, they can determine who would best represent their interests once elected. Yeah, so you mentioned a, a couple different, uh, you know, disciplines that you work in. You wear a number of uh, different hats, including the one there. <laughs> um, I'm kind of wondering, what are some of your proudest accomplishments to date? You know, just uh, in terms of, uh, you know, being a father. I mean, for me, that's the biggest thing in my life. Uh, my son is uh, 23 years old, and he's in graduate school. So uh, he's not going to go earn a law degree. He's uh, working on a psychology degree. Uh, to figure out why his dad wears this uh, tri-corner liberty hat. So, but uh, you know, other achievements is just the volume of work that I've done. Is that I've uh, filmed and produced uh, hundreds of games and uh, other content for the community. So, uh, you know, they go to the games and watch it. But uh, this way, the parents can send the link to the grandparents, cousins, friends that live out of town, and they get to enjoy this experience of these kids. Uh, in very, uh, very wonderful achievements. You know, I get to film uh, district titles and uh, other games, and so it's uh, that's what I get the biggest joy out of. I can't be out on the court playing anymore, but uh, I can preserve that moment for people. Yeah, and so you mentioned the the, the tri corner hat. Um, what, why do you uh, wear that? Because you wear that in a number of. Um public uh, type engagement so wh why do you wear that and what's the significance yes I, I wear it just to remind people of our liberties and our freedoms and that uh, the American Revolution was fought for the Bill of Rights and the people that founded this country wore hats similar to this so uh, uh, I don't raise any money to run I just do this grassroots thing on my own so you have to be instantly recognizable uh, when you're out there in public campaigning and so by wearing this hat, you know, you look at uh, former President Trump. I think a lot of him winning the election was just the, the red hat he wore with a slogan on it. But uh, I don't have a slogan on my hat. It's just uh, a representation of freedom. So. And then um, for, this, for this cycle, what initially made you want to run for Congress? Yes, uh, you know, this uh, the first time I'm in the new 4th Congressional District, uh, the pre- Four previous times I ran, uh, Pot County was in the third district. So, uh, you know, when you're a third party independent candidate, uh, you advocate for certain issues. And my biggest issue is dividing our congressional districts into three smaller ones. Uh, the U.S. House was capped at 435 a century ago. Well, the population has tripled in the ensuing years. And so the districts have grown in size. And 
There's only 435, so states like Iowa, they're uh, at the risk of losing a congressional district every 10 years, <clears throat> which means that the state has one less vote in the electoral college also. And so uh, just advocating for smaller constituencies, I started doing that eight years ago, continue to do it. Uh, uh, four years ago, I finally put a name on the concept, and I call it the Iowa Compromise. So it's just divide by three, but divide their salary, uh, divide the staffers. They get 20 paid staffers, and there's a million-dollar office budget on top of the salary to represent us. So uh, in the current third district, uh, which I'm still in, uh, Congresswoman Democrat Cindy Axney has three offices. Well, when Republican David Young was in that office, he had three offices in the state of Iowa. So I'm not sure how many offices uh, Congressman Feenstra has, but you know, if I was elected in an alternate reality, I think there should be an office in every county in each congressional district here in Iowa. So it sounds like just I've, I've seen you um, talk about that issue before with uh, the House of Representatives. Um, along with that, what would you say some other top priorities of yours would be if you were to be elected in November? Well, uh, you know, there needs to be a very, very uh, strong peace initiative uh, to resolve the conflict that's going on in the Ukraine and Europe uh, between Russia and the West. Uh, similarly, with the uh, conflict, the arguments over Taiwan, uh, you know, it sort of scares me when I hear elected officials at the federal level call Ukraine our ally and they call Taiwan our ally uh, because when you do that, if there was a formal treaty, a defense treaty, we would automatically be involved when they were attacked. So, you know, uh, Putin is a dictator, uh, Xi of China is a dictator, but, uh, you know, you have to stand up to these people and let them know that uh, there are people here in America that don't want war, but, uh, you know, we're not going to just roll over, so. And um, what do you believe... Um, sets you apart from your uh, two challengers in this race? Well, uh, just the idea of dividing the representation into smaller constituencies. Uh, I have heard uh, Ryan Melton talk about that. You know, him and I have gotten to know each other, and he thinks that smaller constituencies uh, should be something that should be considered. I don't know about Congressman Feenstra. He, uh, he's going from representing 39 counties to 36 counties but you know there's three counties down here in southwest Iowa that were part of the Des Moines district the last decade and so you know it's going to be difficult for him to sort of hit the ground running here in a in a district uh, that has these new counties and just the the vast size of it I mean it uh, stretches over multiple uh, regions of the state and to win an office like this uh, you've got to reach uh, half a million voters who get their attention and so, you know, you have to place ads in the different uh, media markets. There's major media markets. There's small ones. And so, uh, you know, I don't know how many votes I'll get come election day, but uh, what you do, it helps myself and the other candidates, you know, get, uh, get some name recognition and uh, get to know the people. The people get to know us and what we stand for. So. Yeah, and one thing I was curious about um, with you and, you know, talking about this issue with, you know, more representation in the, in the U.S. House, um, how much do you think that that would kind of cure a lot of what ails the, the current political process? Do you, do you think that would, like, remedy a lot of um, current problems that we see? I, uh, Jared, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think it would be a successful endeavor. Uh, just because my experience is out there is that uh, the electorate and the voters are so highly polarized that uh, sometimes they don't even uh, want to sign your nomination petition and allow you to run for office if you're not with their uh, party. They're, you know, they're, it's almost sort of a tribal mentality, a gang mentality that these parties have. And it's just unfortunate that it's that way. You know, the very first Congress, uh, James Madison and James Monroe ran for the district in Virginia, and they campaigned together, you know, and uh, Madison won. Thankfully, he was there in the first Congress and wrote most of our Bill of Rights and, and everything, but uh, him and Monroe campaigned together, 
you know, they went to the same locations. I don't know if they rode a horse or a carriage, but uh, I think that says a lot about the American character that uh, we need to bring bring that back. You know, not to see our opponents as uh, our mortal enemies. They're just their fellow citizens who have some different ideas about good government. And then kind of uh, putting the button on everything, ultimately, why do you think um, voters should choose you in November? Well, I'm on the ballot to advocate for liberty through smaller constituencies. And for those of you that uh, want to have this idea uh, looked at and talked about, the more votes I get, uh, the more attention that uh, the other two candidates, whoever wins, they have to pay attention to what's going on. And they can win back those voters. You know, all they have to do is propose smaller constituencies. But, uh, you know, there's other issues that I advocate for ending the, uh, the drug war. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Iowans that are in pain, suffering, and they don't have access to cannabis products that citizens of other states do. Uh, you know, one other thing is that our debt-based fiat currency system, uh, we can see the purchasing power of the dollar is being destroyed through inflation, but I was warning about that eight years ago when I gave a speech at the State Fair and the Des Moines Register wrote about how I talked about the threat of inflation. So certain sectors of the economy, like uh, photography, you know, I don't do much photography work these days because these digital cameras have made... Uh, my job sort of uh, unneeded. So I know how the sons of the, the buggy uh, whip makers felt a hundred years ago when they couldn't make buggy whips anymore with the internal combustion engine and the cars. Okay, um, well, those were all the questions that I had for you. Okay. Um, Brian Holder, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Recording stopped. Okay, and then like I said, I have some uh, sure. questions, but I'm going to start up a new audio recording. So oh, yeah. To separate stuff. That's no problem. Um, all right. So, let me pull my questions up here again. Let's I'm going to have a cigarette if that's okay. Yeah, go for oh, it. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, one of my um, first questions for you, and, and I've seen you say this too, and you talked a little bit about it um, a second ago is that you're running in part as sort of an exercise in self-government just to see what it would take to get on the ballot. Um, why, why is that kind of important for you to do an exercise like that? Well, uh, eight years ago, we had really good and fair and just ballot access laws. But uh, myself and other candidates have run in multiple cycles, and the Iowa GOP <coughs> considers me a spoiler. They sort of think I cost uh, former Congressman David Young's last two elections just by running for office and advocating for smaller constituencies. So they moved uh, the filing deadline for myself and other independent and third-party candidates from uh, uh, August to March to prevent us running candidates two years ago. Well, uh, this year I had to meet the March deadline, which I did, but uh, a year ago the Republicans increased my signature threshold by 300 to 400 percent and they also increased the threshold to conduct a caucus or a convention by three or four hundred percent so if you look at the laws that they've passed you can see they're restricting ballot access and I believe it's because you know liberty people like like me have uh, caused them problems um, an issue that's come up in a couple of the other candidate discussions I've had um, is the use of eminent domain to build carbon capture pipelines. Um, there are at least two projects like that currently progressing in our neck of the woods in, in the Sioux City area. I'm wondering where do you kind of stand on the use of um, eminent domain for that kind of work? Well, the Supreme Court opinion back in 2005, the uh, Kilo uh, versus City of New London opinion, it uh, the majority opinion totally changed the nature of the relationship between citizen taxpayers and the government in regards to eminent domain. So the Supreme Court said they can take it not just for a public use, which is what the amendment requires, the Fifth Amendment requires a public use, but uh, they change it to a public purpose. Well, uh, a public purpose can be anything under the sun. Uh, people can justify this is a public purpose or that, it benefits the public. 
just because a corporation wants to put a place in somewhere and it's going to increase the uh, tax revenue to the to the state, uh, that's not a compelling justification to take someone's business or home or farm. So this misreading, this misinterpretation by the Supreme Court is costing people their their freedom and their rights. And so you know that's something that another case is going to have to be brought to overturn that onerous opinion. Uh, but uh, you know the uh, the people the here in Iowa, the Public Utilities Board has basically been given carte blanche to determine whether these pipelines go in. And that's a total failure on the part of the Iowa General Assembly not to limit the jurisdiction of the Iowa Public Utilities Board. I believe these things are something that should be, you know, put before the general public, just like, uh, you know, public spending for community colleges to improve their physical plant and uh, other taxes, so. Um, and then um, it, it wouldn't be uh, Iowa without a question about uh, farming. Um, sure. Very recently, we had a story about, um, you know, the concerns that farmers around here had about drought conditions um, affecting their harvest. Um, I, I don't know if there's one quick, you know, fix to something like that, but is there anything that you would pursue or like to see done to maybe make things easier on some of those farmers? Well, you know, uh, with the weather and stuff, they're at the mercy of the of the weather patterns. Uh, I know some people on the left are claiming it's from global warming and stuff and, uh, quote, climate change, whatever that means. It, that can be defined different ways. But uh, we're in these solar cycles with that big orange glowing ball in the sky. And so there was a time during the... Uh, uh, American Revolution where it was some of the coldest winters we'd had and that had to do not with man-made uh, pollution but with the sun itself so but the farmers you know they should get the best prices for their crops and for the other uh, commodities they produce uh, you know here in Iowa I know there's complaints about the road and bridge system uh, the the farm to market roads need improvement there's lots of bridges that need fixed and recently, I just heard on the radio today that the uh, the Mississippi River is down so much that the barge traffic shipping costs have increased uh, 400% just to get stuff. And then there's another threat if you ship it west that there's a, a looming uh, railroad worker strike. So the farmers are sort of getting it uh, tough from both different sides. But, you know, everything we can do to help the farmers... I'm not a farmer. Uh, I haven't had farmers in my family in uh, generations. So, but I know that our lifeblood here is the agricultural community. And another kind of um, ag-related question I had for you. This is another big story we reported on recently that um, Tyson Foods was going to be moving a couple hundred jobs from the Sioux City area to, to Northwest Arkansas. And I, I was kind of wondering too, what role do you think there is for a person in Congress? to work to make sure that um, you know companies of that size aren't moving out that many jobs and potentially you know threatening uh, Iowa communities well it's you know as driving across the fourth district uh, some of these towns only have uh, one or two uh, major employers in them and if that uh, business leaves uh, those uh, those employees are not only out of a job but they may be out of a home so you know any policies that can can make sure these people between jobs don't fall through the cracks of the the social safety net. <clears throat> uh, the other thing is that a lot of these jobs are being replaced by uh, technology, by robotics and things, and so there may not be a need for people to work in certain industries in these small towns. And so you know the state of Iowa needs to examine this and how can we maintain a quality of life that people want to stay living in these towns. I know around here in the Council Bluffs Omaha Metro, a lot of the smaller counties, uh, people either move to Omaha, Council Bluffs for work, or they have to commute. And, you know, I don't like to see people uprooted from their communities, and I hate to see workers have to, you know, spend several hours of their day just in transit uh, to their workstation. So, but, you know, the pandemic showed that some of these... Uh, Jobs can be done at home, like you and I are communicating here on Zoom. And so I know a lot of people that they were still able to maintain their employment through the pandemic just through technology. Um, 
And then uh, a little, little bit of a, a pivot away from a couple of questions on the same topic. Um, something that's obviously come up quite a bit in a lot of the federal election races like this one um, is abortion. And uh, especially after the Dobbs decision, which effectively uh, reversed Roe v. Wade. I'm, I'm wondering, um, where do you stand on the matter? Do you think there should be um, restrictions on abortion or do you think there should be exceptions? Where, where do you kind of shake out? Well, I'm a... 50 year old male uh so i you know i don't have any control over what uh, somebody does that's uh, that's pregnant uh the other thing is i'm a roman catholic so i've said this before i promote a culture of life and liberty but uh we need to have these conversations among ourselves about whether it should be codified at the national level or whether each state legislature uh, should decide on restrictions or you know, no restrictions at all. I think it's a very sad uh, state of affairs, a sad commentary on our society when something so divisive and personal is uh, becomes a political issue that that we have to discuss this. So, I've known women that have been in situations where they uh, felt they had no alternative but to uh, end the pregnancy. And uh, you know, all I can do is pray for them, pray for their healing, and. Uh, you know, but we need to have these discussions. I'm, I'm curious, especially, you know, because you're running as like a, a Liberty Caucus candidate, as, as you said, and you've made a, a big um, point of that in particular. Um, what do you make of the argument that, you know, conservatives will sometimes have lob against them that, you know, hey, you, you don't want government, you know, making all these kinds of decisions, but you're OK with um, letting government make a decision about whether or not someone should have a child? Do you think there's a, an inconsistency there? And do you think you kind of avoid that inconsistency in the way you think about this? Well, uh, you know, the I guess the inconsistency would be, uh, you know, some conservatives want the death penalty, but they're anti-abortion. Uh, and vice versa. There's people on the yeah. left that, you know, support abortion rights, and there's people that, uh, and then they want to end the death penalty. So, you know, it's... Uh, what was your question again? I'm sorry, I got lost. No, my that, 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 that was kind of along those lines. Yeah, no, that um, that that sort of answers it actually. Okay, it's like, yeah. you, what can I do about it? I can pray. I can uh, try to counsel people, and then there's one. The, the nuclear option is to uh, not work and do the Henry David Thoreau. I'm not going to pay taxes uh, on philosophical mor moral grounds. So. Mm -hmm. But I just, I hate seeing it politicized, uh, you know, just like the immigration issue is something that's been politicized, and politicians will take someone's very sad story, some tragedy, and uh, use it to score political points, and it's like, I, I can't do that kind of stuff, but I can't also uh, ask people to donate money to me and uh, vote for me. I just haven't been able to... Uh, cross the head threshold so I'm the protest vote if people want to protest the system uh, peacefully here's a way to do it and I always advocate other people run for office like I have get involved because uh, they'll see very quickly that uh, oftentimes you have to completely sell out your principles uh, just to get elected and to get reelected and the amount of money is sort of obscene that uh, candidates have to spend yeah, and then uh, one question I kind of had about more um, the race itself, um, and uh, Mr. Melton has made uh, a lot of noise about this. Um, there haven't been any full candidate um, debates or forums in this cycle. Is that frustrating at all to you? And do you think that voters should even really care about the fact that there haven't been any debates or forums with all the candidates? Uh, I wouldn't call it frustrating, but, <clears throat> excuse me, I would call it, it's disappointing. It's, it, you know, as someone that grew up on America and Americana, uh, I always had this expectation that if I ever did run for some office and there were forums, uh, I'd be invited if I was on the ballot as a candidate. And to discover that that hasn't happened uh, multiple times, uh, especially with Iowa Public uh, Television, now Iowa PBS, you know, I think, uh, I said this at the state fair, I think we need to take every opportunity to talk with our fellow citizens who are also candidates. Uh, you know, Randy and Ryan and I should all be equal, uh, considered as equals running for this office. 
And just to separate them out from me, uh, because of the fact that you know I'm a new new organization, new party, and I'm sort of the the, the little guy, even though I'm six foot seven. So uh, you know, I would. Uh, one other thing in 2018 and 2020, I was in forums. Uh, there were actually debates on KMA Radio in Shenandoah with David Young and Cindy Axney. And that those two hours I got to spend with them were wonderful experiences uh, because we were on a uh, radio station broadcasting out to tens of thousands of people. Uh, they live streamed it. And I think the voters were really, really served by us uh, agreeing to participate in those forums. I know uh, some people say if you run for office and there's a forum, uh, you should automatically have to appear in a forum. Uh, I wouldn't do that to somebody, but uh, I think it's great when, when you can discuss these things because you're going to find common ground. Uh, no matter you know who dominates the conversation or who has the better ideas, we all have to work together. We all have to figure out a way to uh, make sure our freedoms are intact, but uh, uh, the government and the union is preserved. And um, kind of changing topics again here um, to gun control. Um, I know Mr. Melton, at least, has talked about the need for um, universal background checks, um, closing gun show loopholes, and enacting uh, red flag laws, among some other things, too. Um, where do you kind of stand in the, the gun control discussion? Do you think there's more that uh, needs to be done? I'm not sure if more needs to be done, but things need to be done more efficiently uh, and better. You know, there's so many of these school shooters that sent up multiple red flags that they were uh, a deeply disturbed individual and they were, you know, preparing to act out and then did act out. Uh, so those things are things that really stand out in my mind is that, uh, you know, the Homeland Security, FBI, uh, local fusion centers need to get involved. To find these people before they uh, act out. Uh, similarly, with the uh, the school system, the, you know, the, the guidance counselors. Uh, there's community counseling services. Uh, these people, I believe, are mandatory reporters uh, if there's a threat to the public from one of uh, these individuals. So, you know, that system of notification and uh, in, intelligence should uh, should be working for us to pre prevent these things before they happen. Uh, in terms of uh, the red flag laws, you know, some people are in favor of them, uh, some are against. I would have to examine the language of the statute very closely because this is something that could be used to, uh, as a political tool to uh, put restrictions on your opponents. You know, in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc countries, uh, they used psychiatry to suppress any dissidents that uh, swayed away from the communist ideal. And so, you know, to see the, uh, uh, the use of, of uh, psychiatry and stuff uh, against people, that, that should not uh, happen here in America. You know, the assault weapons ban, uh, you know, that depends on how you define an assault weapon. Uh, oftentimes, these are just uh, cosmetic features on the firearm that uh, bear no uh, relation at all to the lethality of the weapon. So uh, people have owned magazines that hold more than 10 rounds uh, for decades. Uh, I don't think those items, that property needs to be confiscated. I don't think it needs to be registered. Uh, I'm not in favor of registering firearms. But here in Iowa, you buy a handgun at a gun show, uh, you're required to uh, show to the seller that you have a permit to purchase or carry. So, you know, the gun show loophole here uh, isn't as bad as it is in other states. Um, and then um, earlier this month, um, President Biden uh, pardoned thousands of people that were convicted of uh, federal, uh, marijuana possession on the federal level. And I'm wondering, um, what did you make of that? And um, do you support uh, marijuana decriminalization or legalization? Yes, I support uh, decriminalization. Uh, with legalization, you end up having a situation where uh, it's like now with the state of Iowa would be controlling the uh, sale of uh, cannabis products. And, you know, not all the cannabis products are the same. Uh, you know, we need to look if it was something that was going to happen. But look at Colorado and other states that have been down this road. But I know there's Republicans in the state uh, government here that 
they uh, they will never vote for decriminalization or legalization. And there's uh, there's too many people here in the state of Iowa that uh, want the right to uh, to use these products to treat their medical needs. So. Um, and then uh, kind of kind of winding down. Um, where do you plan on uh, being on election night as uh, all the results are coming in? Uh, I plan on being home just to watch the uh, the television and see uh, see the results coming in. Uh, you know, it's interesting living here in Council Bluffs. Uh, most of the media uh, will be focused on the uh, races across the river in Nebraska with uh, Don Bacon, uh, Congressman Don Bacon, Republican, and uh, Democrat Tony Vargas and their race. So, uh, you know, I've had friends that are uh, liber- liberty people, libertarians in Nebraska that want me to run for Congress over there in Omaha where the district would just be in one county and uh, I wouldn't have to... Uh, travel all across the district like Lewis and Clark. So I haven't done that yet, though. Yeah, I'm an Iowan uh, for life, and uh, I love living here. I think we have the greatest state in the country, and uh, that's why I did this Liberty Caucus thing. Just uh, And it's just me. You know, I had to, to create this organization just to get on the ballot, The uh, you know, but uh, we were successful. But I had to travel to Okaboji and ask people, to allow me to run for Congress, complete strangers, and we shouldn't have to do that. You know, the district should be small enough that you're a member of your local community, but, you know, if we had a representative uh, elected in each county to help our U.S. representative, that's another another concept, you know, or people that want to volunteer to help represent, so... It's it's enough of a drive from uh, Sioux City to Okaboji, so you you made quite a haul going up there. I did five hundred uh, miles in one day to get nominations, uh, and you know, and I had people up in uh, Sioux County that uh, wouldn't allow me to run for Congress just because they're friends with Randy, uh, which is great that they're friends with him, but uh, I wouldn't keep Randy from running. You know, if he came down here looking for endorsements, I would. And I did endorse Randy's uh, petition, so I signed it at a local Republican Party meeting when his uh, uh, petition sheet was there. So, and then I I did register on uh, primary day and voted in the Republican primary for some friends of mine, and I did vote for Randy in the Republican primary. And then uh, I, I was curious, uh, what uh, what position did you play in basketball, and uh, what did you play in baseball? I I pitched. Uh, Started out as a first baseman, so I pitched and played first base in high school and pitched in college. Uh, basketball, I was a, a center, a classic center, play with your back to the basket, uh, low, low post, uh, mid post, but uh, I had to develop my skills uh, with my back. I have a back injury. I got hurt when I was 16, and so I didn't have a... I know. I got undercut in a JV game, so JV basketball is where you get hurt. But uh, so I developed a uh, a shot where I release it over directly over my head, so I don't have to jump as high, and I can still get it off over taller, uh, more athletic players. So, and I play every Sunday at the Council Bluffs Y. It's uh, four on four in the C Recreational League. We call our own fouls, and uh, it's been a great experience. I've been doing this for. 25, 26 years now. So I, I guess that then uh, you said you uh, pitched up through college. So that would make uh, three elections in a row now for this uh, district. That you've had a uh, someone who's a pitcher, right? Yeah. Now J D. Schultons was a much better pitcher than I ever was. So I, I uh, with my back injury, I didn't throw uh, with high velocity, but I tried to throw. Uh, Split finger, knuckleballs, that kind of. I basically threw batting practice, but uh, I had some good fielders behind me. So that's that's what makes it breaks it. That's right. Um, I uh, I don't have any more uh, questions for you. Okay. Um, again, thank you for uh, all of your time and everything. Oh, thank and you so much. I'm, I'm not sure when our profile for this race is going to be running. It obviously it'll be before election day, but. We're moving some of like the schedule around just to fill in holes and everything. So I think this might be coming out next week now. But um, okay, I'll, I'll try to let you know if that changes. Oh yeah, and uh, you know I may get votes in Sioux City because I filmed uh, Helan and East and North and West basketball games. 
uh, you know, and I may, uh, but I lost 85, 90% of my voters with this redistricting. So I may go from 15,000 down to four or 5,000, but there may be some, you know, people out there that want to vote, uh, vote for me. So I, who knows? I, I won't know until uh, November 8th. And I, I won't be surprised at whatever the results are. So. Are you still with me? Yep. Okay, it yep. froze up for a second there. Oh, that was, that was a bad time to freeze up. All, all I said was um, uh, thanks again for, for chatting with me. And, uh, oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much, and I appreciate your hard work on informing the public. So, Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Are you a basketball player, too? Uh, I Well, I, I played in uh, like up through high school and was not very good, but I, I love basketball. It's the sport I watch the most, and... You know, read about the most and everything. Oh so. yeah, I mean, I'd love to show up for a shoot around with Randy and Ryan and make a a fundraiser for the local community. You know, uh, and we don't have to play against each other. We can, you know, help each other out. The three of us shoot on one half of the court for a fundraiser. A penny, a basket, we'll give to the community, and and then the local community members are at the other ba uh, basket making theirs. So, yeah, all right. Well, uh, have a good rest of your day, Brian. Hey, thank, thank you. you so much, Jared. You have a great one. And hit, hit me up anytime you need any info. So. Can do. All right, thank you.